Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and this is the third of nine videos in the Building a Wordle App Clone series. In this video, we'll finish the UI for our game by creating our keyboard. We'll be adding more properties to our Wordle data model to manage color changes, and we'll need a new key and keyboard view. We'll also have to use a different way to scale the keyboard to fit our wide variety of screen sizes. If you like this series, please leave a comment below and give the video a thumbs up. Be sure you subscribe to my channel and make sure you ring the bell to get notified of new videos. If you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. As we do when we start every one of our videos, I'm going to make sure that I start a new branch. We can call this branch Lesson 3 and make sure we're branching from Lesson 2. And then also make sure that it's checked out as the current branch. So in this lesson, we're going to be creating our keyboard. It's just going to be 26 buttons, each representing one of the letters of the alphabet, plus one for the entry of the word, and one for backspace, giving us a total of 28 buttons. The size of each letter will be the same, but the enter and backspace keys will be slightly larger. So we can create a view that represents the letter key first and then replicate it 26 times. Once a word has been entered, the color of the key will change depending on whether or not the letter has been ever matched correctly, in which case it will have a green background color, which we have a custom color for called correct. Or if the letter has been found in the word but not in the correct location, it'll be a yellow color and we have one called misplaced in our custom colors. If the key has not been used, which is the default, the color will be the unused color, and if it's used and not in our word, the color will be set to the wrong color. This means then that we'll need to track the letters used and whether or not they have ever been matched along with a dictionary where the key is the string representing the letter and the value is the determined color based on what I've just said. Let's start then by creating our property called key colors, and we'll initialize it as an empty dictionary with a string as the key and color as the value. And then in our populates defaults, we can create a string that is all of the letters in the alphabet, and then loop through every character in that string and convert it to a string and use it as the key for our key colors dictionary and assign it our default value, which is the unused color. Let's start first then by creating a view for our letter button. Inside the views group, create a new Swift UI file and call it letter button view. This view will need access to the data model, so it will know that the background color is, and it will also need a letter to work with. So let's create these two properties first. An environment object, accessing our data model, and a letter, which will be a string. Now we can pass in a sample letter to our preview, like a capital L, and also inject an instance of the data model into the preview's environment. This is going to be, as I mentioned, a button. So let's create a button, but we'll leave the action empty for now. And but for the label, we'll create a text view displaying that letter that gets passed in. I'm going to size the button and style it as follows. We'll select a font where the system size is 20. I'm going to set a fixed frame with a width of 35 and a height of 50. And then I'll set the background to our data model's key colors for that letter. So it's going to access that dictionary using the letter as the key and return then the color, which is the value for that dictionary. And the foreground color initially will be primary. So all of our letters initially will have that unused background color. Let's remove any button decoration by applying a plain button style. 
For the action, we'll need to add a letter to the current word that we are typing. So I'll need a function in the data model that accepts a letter as an argument, like this. Of course, this function doesn't exist yet, so let's stub it out in our data model and come back to that later to complete our body. Also, let's add some markers here so that we can keep our code organized. And up here, let's create one for setup. Well, that's it for this view. Let's move on now to creating the full keyboard. Inside the views group, create a new SwiftUI file and name it keyboard. It too will need to know about the environment, so let's get access to it with an environment object accessing our Wordle data model. And then, as usual, we must inject that into our preview environment as well. Now, my keyboard is going to have the QWERTY design, so the letters in the three rows will match the letters of a QWERTY keyboard. So let's create three arrays, and we'll do that by mapping the characters of a string representing a row into an array of string. For example, the first row will be the top row array, which uses the letters Q W E R T Y U I O P, and we'll map that by converting each character into a string. And we'll do the similar thing for the other two rows as well. The keyboard then will be a V stack with three H stacks with a spacing of two between the buttons in the H stack. So we can start by doing that like this, where we use a for each loop to loop through each element of the array using self as the ID, and then create an instance of the letter button view, passing in that iteration's letter. Now the third row requires two more buttons in the H stack on either side of the for each loop, one for the enter function and one for the backspace. So we can create those as buttons. We'll create the buttons but leave the action out for a minute. But for the label, I'll use a text view, in the first case, with a string called enter. And I'll stylize it using the same system font of a size 20. I'll set the width though to 60, but keep the same height of 50. I'm going to set the foreground color to primary. And I'll use the background color of unused. For the back button on the other side of the loop, we'll create another button. But this time for the label, I'll use a system image of delete.backward.fill. I'll set the font to a system size 20, but use a heavy weight. Then I'll set the frame to a width of 40, but keep that height of 50. The foreground color will be primary, and the background color will be the color, which is the unused color. Now we'll be coming back to this view in a later video because we're going to want to disable the keyboard during some states of our app, and to disable the enter key as well until all five letters have been entered. We can, however, enter calls to some functions that we will stub out in our view model. So for the enter key, let's call a function that we'll call enter word. For the backspace key action, let's call one that will simply remove the last letter in the word. And we can call that function remove letter from current word. 
So now we'll need to return to our data model to stub out those two functions. So within our gameplay section, we'll create the function enter word. And then the second one, remove letter from current word. Now the one final thing we need to do before we add this to our view is to know how do I scale this for different devices. Since we've designed this for the iPhone 13 Pro, it looks pretty good here in the preview. But if we were to switch to other devices, like a smaller one, the keyboard is far too wide. And then if I switch to an iPad, it's too small. So what I've chosen to do in this case then is to use a scale factor that I can apply to my device, depending on the width of the screen. And I'll use the width of my iPhone 13 Pro, which I know to be 390 as the base. So let's return to that global enum file now and create a new static property that I'm going to call keyboard scale. And then I'll create three categories based on the minimum dimensions to switch on. The first is going to go from 0 to 430, which is the width of the largest iPhone in portrait mode. And then two other scales for iPads, depending on the width. And remember that since it can be in portrait or landscape, we'll have to make a decision based on the minimum dimension. For the iPhone, I'll just scale up or down by creating a ratio based on the screen width and the width of the iPhone 13 Pro. For the mid-sized iPad, I'll use a scale of 1.2, which has to be a CJ float. And then for the large one, I'll make it slightly bigger, so my scale is going to be 1.6. So it's all going to be based on that iPhone 13 Pro keyboard that we designed. Returning to the keyboard view now, we can test this out by applying that scale to the preview and test what it looks like on different devices. Nothing has changed when we display on the iPhone 13 Pro, because that's our base. If we switch to the iPod Touch, it reduces in width nicely. If we switch to the iPad Air, it expands. Now we can switch to Game View. Now that we have our keyboard, and add it to our game view. Let's embed this board grouping inside another V stack and add a spacer on either side of it. After the last spacer, add a keyboard and a scale effect that is our global keyboard scale. Also, let's add some padding to the top only. And I'm going to add one more spacer. Great. That's enough then for this video because now that our game UI is complete, we'll need to code the game, and that's going to require a clear head. So before we get to the next video, make sure you commit your files to your repository.